of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. This is the February 8th, 2018th Town of Monroe Planning Board Workshop meeting. Uh, Noreen, if you would take a roll call vote of the members here. Anthony Vaccaro is absent. Lisa McQuaid. Right, Present. Rich Triano is absent. Bonnie Franson. Present. James McKnight. Present. Present. Jason Sirwinski. Present. And Jeff Manson. Present. Thank you. So we have one, two, three, four, five members. There being a quorum, we'll open the meeting. I'd like to point out the fire exits. Uh, there's an exit over by the kitchen, another exit, uh, the main door out that way, and then there's an exit uh, behind me uh, to go to the parking lot. Uh, with that, I'd like to start the agenda with uh, Scunamunk Road subdivision number 15-017. Could you state your name for the record? Good evening, everyone. My name is John Queenan from Lankin Tully Engineering, the engineer for the applicant. We're before you tonight with a, uh, with a sketch residential subdivision plan uh, of the existing property located at 262 Scunny Monk Road. Um, property is located about 1,000 feet to the east of the intersection of North Main Street and Scunny Monk Road. Uh, the existing property is, is about 6.1 acres in size um, and currently contains an existing uh, residential dwelling that has access from Scunny Monk Road. Uh, our proposal is to construct um, a new road and we're proposing 11 uh, single family residential lots. Uh, the property is within the SR10 zoning district. Our lots range in size from about 12,000 square feet up to 32,000 square feet. Um, we've provided you with a, with a sketch layout for your consideration. Uh, basically, we're, we're proposing a road matching where the, generally where the existing driveway is today, um, coming into the property and then creating a, a loop around the property. Um, the total length of the road would be just shy of 1,200 feet, uh, with each lot getting access off of that proposed loop road. Uh, as we'll call it. Excuse me one second, Jim. Yeah. There's a PDF in the email if you want to open it up. It came in this afternoon. Can you send us both my email addresses? I did. It's in the, the main one that comes to me, so you should have it. Do you want me to order right now? Uh, I can do that. You can probably open it up with my mail. It came in after I went home. Mm -hmm. So it was from you, Noreen, directly? It came from uh, the office of PM Associates okay. at 434. Let's see if it came in. It's kind of tough to see. <laughs> I don't have, I can't see. Um, is that in the planning board one? No, this is mine. You wouldn't see it in that yeah, one. Yeah, I then. think I would. So you didn't send it there? No, it's in the planning board, but I can forward it right now. Yeah, why don't you forward it and then I can get to it easily. Uh, could you generally describe where this property is located? Sure. Uh, the property is located on Scunny Monk Road. It's, it's basically halfway between the North Main Street intersection uh, where, the, where the firehouse is, and it's about halfway up Scunny Monk Road before you get to the, the turn, you know, heading towards Forest. Okay. So first I'm just going to, I'm at the Orange County website. Yep. It's right here. I'm just trying to zoom in. So it's this property right here? It's this one here. Okay. 
And so the, right now there's, at this point, there's one dwelling unit on it? That's correct. There's one existing house on it. Okay. And you're proposing a loop road that would um, then access Gunnamunk Road only with, again, how many dwelling units? Eleven. Eleven. I know that um, there have been some plans uh, for potential development to the north of that site. Are you familiar with that whatsoever? The, right the larger parcel? Yes. Correct. Yeah, there was an old subdivision plan, I, I believe, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago that had a cul-de-sac that had single family lots on it, yes. Okay. Um, from my perspective, I think uh, we'd want to see whether or not there's potential for interconnections so that um, if a subdivision in the future ever does come in, that there are two axes out um, okay. to Scunamunk. Uh, so maybe a little investigation as far as um, what's happening there. Uh, could you generally describe the terrain? Um, is it wooded? I'm going to zoom in here and try and bring up an aerial map. Um, in terms of uh, topography, um, steepness, is it bouldery, uh, kind of what's the general terrain? Sure. Uh, generally, the, the property is low beginning at Scummy Monk Road and rises up um, to that single family dwelling you see there in the, in the center. And then from there, the property is, is generally rolling. Um, it's flat behind the house, and then it's rolling up to two high points, uh, one to the north um, along this property line here. Can everybody see the TV? See. Okay. So basically up here to the north, and there's another high point over here on the southern. Okay. And then it, it flattens back out down to the back. Okay. So in terms of this uh, sketch subdivision plan, this is really to create a yield because with the new regulations, uh, the applicant is also to submit a cluster development That's plan. Correct. Uh, so the way the process works now is that they will establish what the maximum yield could be based on a conventional layout, meeting all the requirements, zoning, et cetera. And then they are required to cluster to try and preserve meaningful open space, which will have to determine you know, what that is. Uh, and then the planning board makes a decision whether they should pursue um, the conventional or the, the cluster subdivision. And again, it depends on part on the characteristics of the land. Um, in general, I don't know if this has been explored with the applicant, are they wanting to do single family detached dwellings or cluster or sort of what's their thought in terms of what they're looking for? Well, I think they're, they're looking for single family dwellings. Um, I don't think they would have an objection to, to clustering those. Um, I certainly would have to go over that with them depending on you know, how we end up at the f down that road. But okay. I believe their intent is single family dwellings. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And just um, so on the survey map that we did give you, uh, we did locate uh, the trees of significant size that's on, the, that's on your plan, as well as you'll see the, the shading indicated on the plan. Uh, that matches the, um, the requirement of the code for the 30% uh, slopes. Okay. And we've, we have deducted those out of the lot areas uh, in order to get our net lot area. Okay. So, so you took into, cons into consideration the environmental constraints provisions correct. of the new code. Correct. Okay. The, only, the only things on the property that apply... Uh, we we do not have any wetlands. Okay. So we have basically those areas shaded in gray on the map that are the steep slopes, 30% or greater, uh, and the and the clusters of the trees, which I don't think that applies to the deduction, but we showed it anyway. Okay. Um, at some point, we would want our EMC to go out, check out the site, um, see what's there. Uh, certainly, planning board members, if they want to visit the site as well, to get a sense of the terrain and and what's out there. Um, sure. And I believe we already have consent on the application forms that yes. the planning board can visit, correct? Correct. Um, someone's living in the dwelling right now? Uh, I believe so, yes. So uh, I guess we would try and give advance notice before we head out there and someone's surprised to see people sure. traipsing through the property. I don't know whether or not in the past, you know, I've met whoever we set up a time we all, we all walk it together, I, however you want to okay. do that. Because sometimes in the past we've staked out certain features based on this layout for for reference points, okay. Um, so, however, however you want to do that, okay. Um, I would defer to Mark as far as in the past have they, you know, what do we normally like to see staked out? You know, road maybe layout, center line, but you know, kind of locations of dwellings. But 
Um, again, I don't know how far we want to go because they're going to still have to submit um, a cluster subdivision plan. And so what we really want to see, I think, is going to depend on, in part on the, the layout. Um, but yeah, this was, we, we submitted this just to get that lot count. So yeah. that, that from there, then we, that'll drive the cluster plan. Okay. Two things. I think first, the, um, the board would have to decide if they want to go out and review it in the form of the conventional subdivision or wait to, to look at the determination as to the uh, acceptable lot count and then look at a cluster plan and then maybe go walk right. the site to see which may fit into the terrain uh, more appropriately. Relative to the, uh, the uh, count of the lots in the conventional subdivision, at minimum, and I don't know what the board's preference is, but how I normally handle uh, the, uh, the, the initial plan is that we want to see centerline profiles so that we can, at minimum, determine first, do all the lots meet zoning? Secondly, is the road layout realistic? Can they, in fact, really construct this road as depicted and meet the town road specs? If they can't meet the town road specs on the configuration shown on this plan, then I, I don't believe it's a viable uh, uh, lot count plan. Right. So I think that's the first item of business for John is to supplement this with a full bulk table showing compliance of each lot and provide us with a profile, certainly a profile for the proposed road to pretty much show us that the, the conventional layout they're proposing is, is viable. That's no problem. I, just, I wasn't sure at this point with the new zoning how far you know, we had to take that. So that, that's and, fine. Yeah. I'm you that. seeking some input from the yeah. board as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I did forget to mention, just, just for knowledge, uh, we will be using wells for water supply right. and central sewer. Okay. Yeah, we'd, we'd also want to see, so you're on central sewer. We're going to be extending the mains um, to service this project. Is it in the sewer district? Yes. Okay. Yes. I have a question on the map that we have up now. Where is the existing home? Mm. It would be very light right there. Right here. Okay. Is that in the road? Well, it's going to be torn down. Oh, well. okay. <coughs> no, but it isn't within the That was my road. next question. Thank you. Um, and, and the house that kind of looks like it's going to be in the island in by itself, where is the front facing? Like which side does it face? The front is facing north. That way? And then? This would be the like driveway the, right here. The stormwater, how far away is that stormwater facility from its like property boundary or the backyard? Is there going to be any fence? Um, well, depending on the facility that, that actually gets you know chosen and designed, Right now, we just showed an easement area for it, um, and that's about about 80, 80 to 100 feet away. Um, a question for Mark with regard to stormwater facilities. Does the town normally allow them to be on individual properties, and then um, the town can access them via uh, an easement, or does it prefer for them to be on separate lots? It's been handled both ways. OK. Uh, my preference is that if they create a district, that the area be dedicated to the district. That, to me, is the most permanent method to allow access for maintenance. But uh, I think we need to ensure that for 2018, we understand how the town board prefers handling stormwater districts if they want to have stormwater agreements where there is easements or uh, if they would like want dedications. So, for a long time, the town was not inclined to create districts even for substantial uh, subdivisions but there has been some change in that and with the new town board there may be further change again so at some point uh, certainly before preliminary approval when the lot lines would be laid out you should probably visit the town board and get their feeling uh, as to whether they want to see a drainage district if it wasn't a district um, would it be some kind of HOA or some form of I mean how would it be maintained long term Depending upon the size, we have, we have a number of subdivisions in the town where it became the responsibility of the lot owner who bought the land that had the the, the uh, drainage uh -huh. basin on it. From so, I think it's a town board question. I think, from my perspective, um, I think it should be shared by the in all of the property owners that benefit from that stormwater facility. Um, but you know. We have to hear from the town board on that. And, uh, way, and, and in those cases where it has been on an individual lot, we've usually required that an easement be given to the town 
for the purpose of entering onto the land to maintain the uh, imposing or, or granting the opportunity to go on without imposing the obligation to maintain. Okay. Uh, but I agree with Mark, drainage districts, uh, particularly in this day and age of MS4 communities, is the way to go. Right. And, and more especially when a, a road that's proposed is proposed to be a, a town road. Uh, if it's a private road, many times we've linked the drainage improvements into the private road maintenance agreement, limited number of lots. It, it tends to work. But when you have a, a dedicated road, uh, to have that coupled with a single lot, I've seen that cause some real problems. Yeah. I'm just concerned about uh, long-term maintenance um, because, again, unless there's some kind of maintenance bond or fee established, it's falling on that one individual. And, um, again, it, it's there because of the fact that it's the entire development that's generating the name need for that facility. Um, when you established that lot, did you deduct um, the land area for the stormwater facility? No. Because oh. it's a proposed easement, the the code only requires if it's existing easements. All right. And normally, we would include it within an easement area and offer it to the you know to the town for dedication as part of the you know the whole road dedication. Right. Or if the town wants to create the district that. Yeah, we'll that route. we'll take a look at that as far as what the new regulations state. But I could say intent was that you know the stormwater facility shouldn't be included in the minimum lot area because it's not really usable. Um, so I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, the way when I read through that, it was it was, had to be an existing easement, not a proposed. Okay. Um, but even still, that the major. Area, it's a large you know, area. Lot 11, and it's it's almost um, three quarters of an acre in size. So right. I, I think it would still meet the the 10,000 square feet. Um, to the engineer's uh, point with regard to the road layout, you know, we do want to make sure that it's a viable, a real um, road that would meet spec, um, including. I don't know if the town, I don't recall if it's in the subdivision regulations or elsewhere, whether there's a maximum length of a dead end and at what point is that considered a dead end um, because there's only one access out. So I'll, I'll defer to Mark to look that up. Yeah, we'll check that. It, well, in your code, it's 500 feet. Okay. So we did the, that's why we did the first 300 to the loop. And in our opinion, that's where the cul-de-sac basically ends because then you can go in either direction around the loop. Okay, so you're saying that to here, that's 300 feet. That's correct. And that your interpretation is that you go to one side or you go to the other side, that would be the maximum length. Correct. Okay. Well, and again, I... I'd we'll look at it, and I think if there might be a, a another restriction in the subdivision regulations that would have the maximum number of lots off of a single access point. So I, I need to double-check that as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm not that good with the code yet. <laughs> sure. And any board members, if you have questions, please feel free. It was just mentioned the homeowners association, not that there is one with this development, but uh, the bedrooms, it says six bedroom dwellings. Are they townhomes? Are they single family homes? Single family. Single family homes. Is there basements? Like how, and what's the level of the structure? Uh, like well, at, at this story? point in time, we really haven't gone fully into detail on the types of structures. Uh, I labeled the six bedroom dwelling just because it's a larger footprint. It's a it's a 40 by 60 footprint. Okay. And as we proceed down the road with, it's really for sewer connection, they run off of the number of bedrooms. So, so there's, there's really no specific architectural design at, at this point in time. Did you choose the maximum number of bedrooms or are they actually going to be six bedroom homes? Uh, I just chose the maximum for all of them. So it we could don't be, know how many bedrooms. It could, be, it could be five, could be six, you know, it could be four. But we chose a maximum to base, you know, this uh, this application on. Does our approval, do we have to know, the, you know, how many bedrooms are going to be? We would want to know for secret purposes. Correct. Because ultimately the water demand and the wastewater generation, um, there are calculations that are done to ensure that um, the demand can be met. Uh, I believe that there are, um, and I'm not sure for the size of a uh, subdivision, but there are also regulations with regard to water supply, demand, um, making those determinations. I don't know if any kind of well has to be drilled to make those determinations, but um, I know the town of Monroe is more stringent in that regard. It is, and this is subject to Orange County Department of Health approval, so they would be reviewing the realty subdivision and the uh, wells. As far as the sanitary goes, the, uh, it's a bit easier in the fact that they're not on-site disposal. In fact, they're tying the public sewer. It'll go to Orange County for that as well. So our scope of review is a little less limited, mm -hmm. but it is important, I think, that the plan is uh, fully informational on the number of bedrooms. So it's good that he's called it out. Right. 
For the new members, if I could, there's been mention of both a conventional subdivision and a cluster, and just to give you a quick idea what that means. A conventional subdivision would be lots, all of which met all of the bulk requirements, minimum lot size, setback, lot width, lot depth, etc. And that would be once we see a, a, a plan that's, the statute says, approvable, that would be a conventional layout. If there's going to be a cluster, we take that total number of lots, the yield that comes from the conventional, and then the applicant can propose, and you can massage, a layout which collapses that or reduces the uh, strictures of the, of the bulk table so that you can have a, a smaller lot, uh, less of a setback, a more shallow uh, yard area, with the goal of preserving open space that has some value to the community. It might mean here that we keep the houses off those high grounds that uh, John pointed out a little while ago. Uh, it may be that there's some other area that's equally worthy or more worthy of preservation. But that is the idea of a cluster. A cluster can have no more lots than would be approvable on a conventional basis. With regard to the trees that you noted, um, is there an inventory or a summary of the DBH and the species? Yes, okay. I just I just didn't turn it on. It gets you, you lose everything on it. Okay. But yeah, we can we can get that to you. Okay. Um, and, and just looking at this uh, property again, what is this white building here? I believe that's a shed. Just a shed. Yes. And then is what's back in here? Is that anything? That I don't know what that is. Okay. I don't know if it's called out on the map. Uh, it says uh, chicken coop remains. Chicken coop remains, okay. <laughs> Meaning okay. it's going to stay or it's the remains of a chicken? <laughs> 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 Good question. <laughs> and so you're along a utility easement line here, but that's off your property. That, yeah, correct. That's off the southern property. So no portion of it extends into your? No, it does. As you see, the, as the road follows the easement line, it comes in at an angle. Oh, okay. So the so, outside of our right of way matches that easement line. Okay. So we'll want to check also whether or not that affects yield. So that's a, that'll be a mark question. You know, John, it might be worthwhile to have the entire O and R boundary for their easement depicted, even if it's off the property, just to show the route. Okay. So yeah, that, it's uh, it's there. It's just I just put the the right of way line is right on top of it. So you see the dash that goes out on the lower corner of the Scuddy Monk? Yep. It just runs right up the right-of-way line. I'm talking about the other side. And it runs right on the property line. I'll, I'll just, I'll make it more pronounced. Okay. Any questions from the board members? So, um, have you contacted uh, DEC, Natural Heritage Program, done any um, outreach as far as communicating with them? Not yet, no. Okay. No. Um, I think if you could, it'd be great if you could send a letter to DEC. Okay. Um, and again, just to see if there's any species that, as we go through the process, need to be considered. Sure. Um, because if there were, then we may want to evaluate it. Plus, if the cluster's pursued, it may dictate what would be important open space. Okay. Um, yeah, the, um, the EAF mapper that's generated it triggers that as well, so it's already... Um, it's already come up for the bats. For the bats, yeah. 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 I found that um, also IPAC, so the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has an IPAC program, so some species will come in, come up, and you can also contact them. And then uh, sometimes not all the DEC species are generated by the short form or the long form EAF, so it's just good to reach out to them okay. and, and get their comments. I, don't, I think the sooner the better, so we just know what we're dealing with from that perspective. Um, so at this point, this is, you know, again, this is a workshop. Um, this is a sketch. Uh, this is what we just went through is exactly what we wanted to get out of this. We'll come back with, um, we'll get the road profile in there. We'll clean up. We'll, we'll make it a, a workable plan to a certain point, and then we'll go through the, the clustering. Yeah. After Mark, you know, goes yeah, on, on the yield plan, plan, John, and, I'm, and again, I'm reaching out to the board to see because every board requires a different level of a yield plan. Uh, generally, what I've considered the minimum is, as I said, a demonstration of bulk compliance for all the lots, grading, and a profile for the road so that we can see that the road meets the individual town's 
municipal road specifications. Beyond that, there are different levels that Mike said the code or the law says you have to show that it's approvable. I don't know if the law says if it means preliminary approval or final approval. Some boards carry it, I think, a little too far if they really want to have a, a, um, a cluster plan. I'd rather have the focus be on that design. Right. But maybe we can get John to just give us that basic information. I think at the next meeting, if there's more information the board needs on the, the yield plan or the conventional plan, we should probably ask for it then. Right. I, I think um, as far as a yield plan, the things I like to see is, you know, are there crazy driveways that would never meet whatever driveway grade that would be imposed? And that's where the grading of the road right away comes yeah. in. You know, if there's a 30 foot elevation difference between the garage and the road, I wouldn't call that buildable. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the things that we'll look for. Yeah, okay. so it has to be realistic. Um, in this instance, it won't come into play, but if there were wetlands, if you really were you know, proposing the fill of five acres of wetlands, and I would say, no, that's unlikely to be approvable you know, by yeah, any we'll, course. We'll so reasonable expectations as to what could be built. We'll work, out the, we'll work out the grading. We'll show some basic drainage to make sure that we can get that to work. We'll show the sewer. Okay. And uh, I think we'll go from there. All right. Maybe dry, uh, when you do the road grading, um, it might be worthwhile to, sh to depict uh, a approximate floor elevation and a driveway slope. So each driveway would just have an approximate slope, and that shows that the lot is buildable as it may be. Yeah. Which is kind of the spirit of the county's uh, Easy local law as well. I think also, as far as footprints, whether it's the conventional that gets pursued or the cluster, I think a realistic footprint. Um, you know, I've seen small little boxes that are 40 by 40, you know, when someone's actually going to build a five or 6,000 square foot house. Um, you know, ultimately the limits of disturbance. Um, uh, you know, what's being proposed should be relatively realistically reflected on the on okay. the map. So these look like they're bigger. They're, yeah. Yeah, they're on the bigger <laughs> yeah. side, yes. It's been the board's practice, and yeah. John's familiar with it, that we include a condition that doesn't allow any uh, house to be built to a larger footprint than was shown on the plan without coming back with a revised drainage study. Okay. Right. And it usually solves that problem. I think we also um, incorporated into the zoning house relocation notes. Um, okay. So where you show them is where they're expected to be built with minor variations. And again, especially when we start to get into clusters or larger lots, you know, if we did all this work trying to avoid an area because it's environmentally sensitive and then don't have notes, someone could pull a building yeah. permit and put it somewhere entirely different. Um, so that's also new, so you may want to take a look at that. Okay. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. we've, we've, we usually oversize just so we can get through secret with the moat with the max, and then we don't have to go back. So, yeah, that's all. That's well, good. Speaking of secret, there are other agencies involved. Uh, you may want to consider issuing a notice of intent to serve as lead agency so that clock starts to run. Would we do that this evening, or would we do that once we've advanced this a little? It's, it's up to you. Okay. I, I'd like to hold off a little just so we get um, – because I don't know if we're doing the cluster or the um, conventional – um, and we may want to either submit both plans or one plan to those agencies because we would include the um, plan itself when it goes out to the agencies that would be involved in the review. So um, I don't necessarily want to quite get the secret yet, but um, again, I think reaching out to DEC, that's just one agency that's going to be involved anyway. So um, I'd like to get input from them just earlier so that we have that information. We, we're going to ask the EMC to go out. We may go out. Um, so we have that in the back of our minds as we're looking at the site. Sure. And what's the EMC environment? It's our um, council, our, our environmental council. Okay. And they'll also be looking at the tree New acronym. surveys. Okay. I yeah, have we a, were. another question. On this uh, the short environmental assessment form, mm -hmm. it's uh, question number two. Asked, does the proposed action require a permit, approval, or funding from any other government agency? And it says yes, and lists the Town of Monroe ZBA, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I was just wondering, um, you Which know, if question? there's, it's the short environmental assessment form. Let's yeah, see. I have a question too. It says um, Town of Monroe Planning Board, uh, the Highway Department for the for, okay, the, so for the road. What would the ZBA, is there any variances or why would you need to? I don't have, I don't have ZBA on mine. Really? Oh. We have it on mine, ours. We do have it on <laughs> yeah. ours. Yeah, so it's, it is listed. It, this is 262 oh, Scunamon? Yeah. 
We don't need the ZBA. Okay, so I don't know why it's on our form, but. Yeah. No, the ZBA is not required. All the lots oh, will okay. currently. Well, I gave you their packets that meet, they gave me. Yeah, they currently meet the. Uh, <laughs> and my, my okay. code. one does oh, not thank have you. it. Well, the ZBA shows up on the uh, short form from 15. But it, it's all, uh, there's two, there's one from 15 and one from 18. Yeah, this was an so original, yeah. I guess uh, the plan change when the correct plan, if I follow that correctly. Yeah, um, 100%. So, yeah, it came off there. But, yeah, I noticed that, too. Uh, yeah, back in the back in 2015, there was an original application before the moratorium well, for this. Right. That's but that's kind of odd because it, were the, was the EAS mapper already in place in 2015? December. No, we, yeah. we did a new one. You should have a new one for... Right. This application. This 2015 that signed 2015, it no, looks. No, we did a new one. You right. No, no. I'm just saying this one that said ZBA on it. Mm -hmm. It looks like it was run through the EAF mapper. Correct. I just didn't know that it was actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe it has been in place that long. Yeah. Put and the that old one in the back of your folders. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> correct. That that application did require ZBA, but okay. this one does not. Okay. So that's just for history. Yes. Uh, as long as we're talking about the. Uh, short environment. I have a question about um, question number 12, uh, 12B. Is the proposed action located in an archaeologically sensitive area? And that's yes. What about this property is archaeologically sensitive? It's, it could be nothing. It, okay. could, it could simply be when you do the EAF mapper, it mm -hmm. generates answers. So when you punch in, you pick the address, you pick the property. Okay. The DC has a database. And if it's in an area that, you know, maybe half a mile away, there was a site that had archaeological sensitivity, it uh, defines a zone, and then it automatically will select yes. And then it's up, it's up to us to basically prove otherwise or find out if there is something on the property. So, again, policy question. Um, when it falls within an archaeologically sensitive area, is there just a presumption that a cultural resource survey is necessary, or would the planning board contact SHPO and get their input? Normally, it's referred up to SHPO for a response. They may, in fact, uh, give a clarification on what might have triggered the yes Correct. Okay. And indicate that this particular site may not be involved. Okay. Now, I know with I the... I believe, I think it's the firehouse on the corner, I believe, triggers it. I'm the much. firehouse? I think so. As but opposed to the chicken coops? Yeah. <laughs> it might have been the chicken coop. <laughs> you never know. It could, be, it could be an ancient chicken coop. Yeah, um, no, I mean, there was the reason that archaeologically sensitive area is there is they found something. Correct. And so it's a radius drawn around an actual, you know, archaeological something. site. So or it could be a building or, or something that's, you know, yeah. listed on their register. Yeah, maybe that chicken coop will remain. Yeah, maybe it's historic. No, 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 it's, it's, right, it's right in the middle of the, yeah. <laughs> right in the, middle of the site. Do, um, Would I, that also include... Um, there's a lot of stone walls that run through this area, um, including a lot, right? This boundary is the cable cut. Correct. The, right? Um, so I know there's a lot of stone walling that runs through here. Could, would that simply be something possibly if they're old enough, I guess? Would uh, that trigger that kind of thing or not really? I, Depending on where you are, yes. I don't know that it would be here. Um, up in Marbletown, we've just gone through a whole process where um, – it's been argued that the walls were actually put up by Native Americans. So, uh, you know, I think in this area, a lot of it's farm related. Farms, yeah. Although, having said that, I think um, in future iterations, if there are stone walls, if you could just put them on the plan, general locations, if there are. Yeah, no, usually we did not do the survey, so I'll, I'll have the surveyor locate those. Okay. And then, um, again, process-wise, should we enter this into the CRIS system or have we're them? Gonna ask, we're going to ask the applicant to make the submittal through the CRIS system okay. and then provide a copy of that to the planning board secretary so it's on record. Okay. And then we'll wait for the response. So I think in the CRIS, so the CRIS system is um, the cultural resource information system, I believe. It's a database that is um, kept up by the State Historic Preservation Office and um, it can be entered by the town or it could be entered um, by the applicant. If it's entered by the applicant, I believe you can include other people who should receive whatever responses are um, provided by SHPO. So um, if you would include us on the Chris system as a contact, include Noreen. Sure. Uh, just so she gets the response at the same time you do. Yeah, no problem. Okay. okay. Great. Great. So again, just one of those early, you know, um, they may ask for the site plan. So you could send this one. 
um, to them. I know, again, we talked about trying to get the cultural when we actually do the notice of intent, but just to get an early indication of cultural resource need for investigation, yeah, you know, can be ahead of the game. you That's can fine. send that one up. Yeah, the folks at Park Recreation Historic Preservation no longer will take as part of a secret lead agency circulation, they won't accept the letter and the plan. Okay. They, they want it all, Chris. They um, rather emphatically have told me no several times. All right. Uh, so you have to actually go through the Chris system to make any submittals. All right. So that's why we asked the applicant to do that and copy the, the town. Okay. Very good. Right. Board members, other uh, questions on the submission at this point? It's a preliminary submission, a sketch. It'll give you a sense of the application. You're good? Mark Mike? What's that? All right. All right. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Good night. So with that, uh, the next item on the agenda is Bald Hill Estate Subdivision number 0002-2000. Um, while the applicant uh, comes up, do we have any minutes that are outstanding that we need to take care of? No, I didn't do the one because four docs isn't working right. Okay. So get them done, so hopefully Next time. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Try and find the parcel here. And do you want to go through the PowerPoint presentation first? Sure. Oh, what's your preference is actually, and, and just state your name for the record, everybody who's here. Sure. Uh, George Lithgow from Chikowitz and Gubitz. I am the project attorney. Um, I'm Nirali Dharani uh, from Leonard Jackson Associates. I'm Leonard Jackson of Leonard Jackson Associates. Uh, John Till, architect. Thank you. Leonard and I are here because we're the only people who actually have been involved with this project since it began. <laughs> and I just want to point out two things. One is, if this project was a person, it would be eligible to vote this year. <laughs> And the second is, uh, if you guys are jumping in um, to projects at different points in their life cycle. The one you just had is sort of entering kindergarten. This project is eligible for retirement. Um, you know, we've been, we've been here for a long time. So has anybody watched the minutes or the video from the December meeting? Because I did again just to relive the experience. The, uh, the last board really did try to uh, take this off your plate. They recognize you guys have a lot of learning to do, a lot of experience to gather, and uh, you know, it, it, you're coming in at, sub I was going to say you're coming in at the 11th hour, but you're actually coming in at the 18th year. Um, we've been through this a long time. One of the, uh, the previous chair had asked that I come to the December meeting and give some historical perspective. Uh, give an overview of the project and sort of um, try to frame where it's been, how it came to be, what it is. Um, I think what probably would be more useful to do first is perhaps describe the project as it exists now and then to the extent that it will be helpful to the board, I can give you some uh, historical perspective on how it came to be that project. But I think to get an understanding of what you're dealing with at this point in time, it might be helpful if Narali can take you through the details of the project and describe it. Just a quick question. We received a Bald Hill timeline this evening. Was that prepared by you, Mike, or by the applicant? It was prepared by me. It was okay. distributed at the December meeting, and since okay. I'm not sure if Ms. McQuaid was there, I figured no one else had it. So Okay. I think at some point, um, you know, after the presentation, I don't know if it'll be during the presentation, um, just so the uh, board understands that this uh, particular project is um, subject to the stipulation of agreement. So, you know, to some extent there are things we can do and we can't do. So, um, and you are at the very end of the process here. So, with that, 
Take it away. And let me know when you need me to change the slide. Sure. I have a... Uh, I mean, once you... <coughs> yeah, I'll just go over the uh, description of the site and the location, and uh, maybe you can keep clicking when I ask, and we can keep going. So that's the vicinity of the uh, project, and uh, it's located just south of Route 17, as you can see. If you can click again, you'll see... This is uh, from County Route 105. There's an access to the site. There's one more click. There's Larkin Drive on the east. And right across from the site entrance is Duran Drive. Just to give you a little location uh, perspective of the site. <coughs> and, all right, so uh, this is a 70 acre parcel. And uh, the entrance to the site, if you click on the mouse, it'll show you a 30 foot wide road. That's the entrance to the site. And uh, there's another, uh, there's an emergency access road to the site located on the south. And uh, the, the road is a pub, the, the road where it's highlighted right now is a public road up to that portion, up to the cul-de-sac. And the remaining portion of the road is private road. The entire loop you see that runs along the site is private road. <clears throat> Where, uh, the source of water for this site is two wells. And we have a treatment building located just next to the cul-de-sac where the water will be pumped all the way up to the tank. That's, that's all the way on the uh, west. If you click one more time, you'll see the location of the tank. Actually, I think it's just off because I can see water tank on this. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. oh right there. It. Yep. It's a three, 311,000 gallon water tank that's going to serve uh, water to the community. <clears throat> if you go to the next. All right, so this project is a 70 acre lot and it's going to be divided in three construction phases. There are five different lots on the site, lot one through five, and the entire development is proposed on lot four. That's the first phase of construction, which will have 58, that, that's fine, which will have 58 units in it. So that, that is 58 units? That's correct. And that represents the second phase of construction with 30, 30, 38 units. And the last phase will have 42 units in it. <clears throat> so that, that represents the three phases uh, of the site. Now the remaining phase, the remaining lots, lot one, uh, two, three, and five, are ally zones, and uh, no construction is currently proposed in that. The ally zone, the lot one and two in the ally zones are reserved for future development as commercial lots. There's no proposal yet. How do you, <coughs> how do you get access to those lots? It's through that the main road. You see the lot two. Let me show you. The lot one mm -hmm. and lot two are located right here, so they have access to the main road. Okay, so those are the two LI. It's not beyond. There is a LI road around back of the property, but it's under conservation easement. No development is proposed in that location. Okay, so there's another lot. Yes. And is that being dedicated, or is that who? It, it'll be retained by the owner, but it will be subject to a restrictive covenant. It was originally thought we may be able to get a conservation easement that someone would accept, but the Orange County Land Trust declined. Um, my expectation is the county is uh, the town is not interested in doing it, so we would do a restrictive covenant that would contain the same provisions, basically. Uh, my reaction is I think that probably should be run by the 2018 town board, um, as far as a conservation easement, if that's possible. We have a list of things that we'll be doing with the town board okay. to effectuate some of the conditions. Okay. How, how big is the uh, conservation parcel? parcel? Uh, it's 20 acres, I think. 15, 20 acres. Yeah, it should be around 20 acres. 
So that's in addition to the 70, or that's from the? From the 70. From the 70, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we have two locations of the stormwater uh, management basins, basin A and B. Uh, they'll be constructed during the phase one of the project. Um, and the next slide, the next. Okay, the sanitary sewer will be served, uh, will be connected to an uh, existing sanitor, sanitary sewer trunk, which is owned and operated by Orange County Sewer District. And uh, the central sewer system from the project will connect to that trunk. That's an existing trunk or proposed that trunk? That is an existing trunk. And it goes through wetlands? Or the was wetlands? Uh, the good old it, days. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Okay, so, but it exists, so, it exists, <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right, so the complete uh, project will consist of 138 residential units. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and these stormwater management, these are just the details of plans. The phases. If you want to go into detail, but that's the end of the slide. <coughs> Phase one. These two. Yeah. And a couple of things I wanted to uh, mention was uh, there's going to be a traffic signal that's proposed at the entrance of the site. And you, you can go back to the first slide. The first one? Yeah, these are just the additional s slides in case we want to see them. All right, so at the entrance of the site, uh, a, s a traffic signal is proposed and it's already approved. Uh, the applicant also proposes to uh, also proposes improvements on the county route 105 by adding additional travel lanes on both sides of the road. Um, yep, that was a slide. Okay. Yep. So basically, that's the overall review of the <coughs> project site, and maybe George can go over the his historical aspects. So in the beginning. There was a proposal to do a single family development on this property. Uh, we spent probably a year and a half with the board looking at different options, different designs. We looked at the possibility of some multifamily uh, because of the grades. Uh, after a lot of review and discussion and occasional meetings with uh, representatives from the town, the best option seemed to be to create a URM zone allow development of the hilly area with townhouse kind of development because the grades can be, it's, it's a lot easier than trying to fit single family homes up there. So in 2003, the town did rezone the property to allow that as part of a general rezoning that was going on. One of the town's concerns was uh, LI did allow single family residences in 2003 and before. Um, the town was concerned that the and I think it's the issue you've also heard with the current zoning, that the LI zone was being used up for residential purposes. There, there was a need for um, developable sites, commercial development being uh, tax rateables and other things that would, and job generators. Uh, so the town had proposed to take the LI zone, the residential out of the LI zone. We had uh, a series of discussions with the town board. The town ultimately determined it would rezone a portion of the property for URM and uh, the LI zoning would remain available for the lots that really seemed to suit, well, had grades which could suit development at ready access. And we proceeded to prepare a, an EIS. There was a scoping outline, draft EIS. Uh, there was discussion about water in the course of that and other issues. We wound up doing a supplemental EIS and eventually a finding statement was done in 2008, I believe. The finding statement uh, proposed that, and the development proposed that we would be making a connection to a future extension of Larkin Drive West, that we would construct a portion of that road between um, Larkin Drive, the intersection where Larkin Drive comes in from the east. We would construct an extension further west over what was called the Oliveri property. Mr. Oliveri proved very difficult to negotiate with. He eventually declined to give us permission to do that. Um, 
And basically at that point, we said to the town, what we would like to do is pay you whatever it would have cost us to build that road and we'll use this access point unless you get permission and Larkin Drive West is constructed. If you want to construct that portion of Larkin Drive, if, you, if it goes further, we, you know, whatever the town can accomplish, we're more than happy to help facilitate. So there was a discussion about that. There was a disagreement as to whether or not that was practical for the town or us to do, and litigation ensued. At that point, we were seeking approval for 112 units in a conventional uh, townhouse development. There was an option for us to do more units. What, it, what came out of that was this project, which allows us to do more units, 138, in exchange for a payment to the town of the uh, amount of money that project would have cost, what would have cost us to build the extension of Larkin Drive West to provide access to our property. So after... Uh, I could, uh, so, so right now, this is alternative three with 138 units? Yes. It's actually four, but it's 138 units. Okay, and so you're to make some kind of road contribution still? Uh, yes, $1,010,000. And that's based on $2,010? or it's based on our stipulation of settlement. Okay, thank you. So, yes. so uh, we went through a period of litigation. That awkwardness was resolved in what I think was a constructive manner. And then we uh, ran into our next challenge, which was finding a water supply. We approached the town of Harriman, uh, sorry, the village of Harriman, the village of Monroe, the village of Curious Joel, and explored options with them. Uh, Harriman refused, KJ did not have water, and the village of Monroe wanted a million dollars. Um, since we're already giving a million dollars to the town, we really didn't feel we had the ability to do that. Uh, so we wound up constructing or proceeding to explore the site for water. We found water. We went back to the planning board, which had said uh, in its findings that there would be no, that we were going to use one of those four municipal sources. So we went back and said, we, need, we can't get one of the municipal sources to commit to us. We have found water. We'd like to do an on-site supply. We went through a secret process in 2013. And Wait, I'm sorry, hold on. So, so you received a preliminary approval resolution, but you didn't have water at that point? And that was subsequent to it preliminary approval? It was a condition approval? of the approval that we That you find it. Based upon a municipal connection. Okay. But there was provision that in the event that a municipal connection was not possible, okay. they'd have to come back and demonstrate mm -hmm. that they did have an adequate water supply, uh, and they have done that as well. Okay. And so then 2013, it says the P PB consistency determination, that's the seeker Correct. you're referring to? They did seeker on it. He had Tom Kuzak come and evaluate our water test results, and um, it was approved or accepted as a so with that in hand we then went to DC and in 2014 DC adopted new regular the state adopted new regulatory uh, new regulatory framework for water supply uh, they require a water takings permit now and they require it for us when you have sources that are capable of extracting more than 100,000 gallons a day of water as Leonard can testify, we discovered that DEC interprets that provision very conservatively. Our water supply is uh, 33,000 gallons per day, I believe. And the way DEC looks at that is, you need wells to produce 33,000, you need twice that to satisfy your average daily demand, and you need to have one w the ability to do that with one well out of service. Right means one well, one of our wells, has to generate 66. Mm -hmm. The other well has to generate 66. Therefore, it's 136, and therefore we required water takings permit. Mm -hmm. We explored various ways to work that out with DC to no avail. That took us approximately 18 months to get to a conclusion. 
We applied for the permit in, I believe, 2015. We eventually did receive it last year, and um, we now have a water supply. That was in 2017, water yes. supply permit. Okay. So we now have an approved water supply. Uh, we've gone through the sewer process I mean, it, it, w until we had water. It, it wasn't <coughs> we decided to use the usual process of first find water, then deal with the sewer. Um, we are we have uh, approval from Orange County, not approval. We have gone through the technical review process with Orange County Sewer District. Basically, we just have to make some minor tweaks and go back there. So the water and sewer stuff took us some time to get um, taken care of. And in the interim, DC changed the stormwater regulations and they changed their transition policy in a way that ultimately required us to go and fiddle around with the SWIP so that it conformed to the 2015 standards, notwithstanding that we had filed our SWIP or we had prepared our SWIP in, uh, I'm assuming, 2005, 6. 2005, 2005, we submitted the SWIP. Right. So we, we, have a, we had a SWIP, which by the DEC rules would be eligible to transition from the 2005 to 2010. Uh, DEC, when we discussed it with them, wanted us to modify and upgrade it to meet the 2015 standards. So we did that. Uh, when, we, when was this done? Uh, is it complete? It is complete. Well, <laughs> there's more to it. <laughs> It is complete. We we did go through the process with Mark's office. Okay. They issued the MS4 certification. We submitted the NOI. We went to, and DC said, Oop, we have a couple of issues. Uh, and basically what they want us to do is go, we, pro we had to propose infiltration uh, practices because that's what 2015 requires. And they said, well, since you're now using or proposing to use infiltration, you have to go and see whether or not those sites are capable of infiltration, which means we would have to go develop some method of getting to all of the sites throughout the 70-acre uh, parcel and evaluate the capability at that point. That's what DC's view of it was. So we came, we have proposed a different process instead of infiltration. Uh, Leonard's office is pr proposed and DC accepted a cistern system, and if we do have acceptable infiltration at the site, once, once we're in the process of development, uh, we may request uh, DC approve the infiltration practices for those sites. But one of those two ways, we can do it. It doesn't change other aspects of the site plan as far as I know. So what you see is still what you'll get. Um, I think if you had watched the meeting last month, the, well, at the meeting last month. The uh, December meeting? Yes, the December meeting. Uh, as I mentioned, the chairperson was making a valiant effort to see if we they could get through the process. Uh, there were two issues that the members had concerns about and they wanted us to address. One was the um, architectural guidelines that were required by the preliminary approval. And basically those are, guidelines are required uh, in the words of the, I think it's in the words of the preliminary approval resolution, well, I'll paraphrase, to prevent an ungodly mess. When, you know, this is going to be developed over time, there, there is the potential for uh, different contractors to be work, working on different sections. Um, the board when it granted preliminary approval, wanted assurance that there was a general set of guidelines. So there's a coherent and uh, uh, visually appealing uh, manner of construction taking place. And it took us some time to get to something that we think uh, is what we proposed to do. We had originally, in the FEIS, considered uh, what you might call a 2007 plan. Uh, if you've looked at buildings from that period, they tend to be a little larger, more ornate. They're not really what is you know, the, the current market. Um, the client looked at that uh, for some time and decided it really needed to do something that's more feasible in the current market. Um, John can tell you more about the design that's 
been developed. You have some renderings. Uh, you have a 3D version tonight, yes. which will give you, I think, a good sense of what these things will actually look like. So I want to leave time for him to talk to you about that. But uh, the other important issue, well, two, the two other important issues for the board, last year's board, one was to make sure DPW got its traffic comments back to you, which they have done. Uh, I believe Mark has a copy. I'm not sure if it was distributed to the board yet because it was addressed to uh, the former chairperson. But uh, basically, we have, I think, six comments from County DPW. And uh, they've been reviewed by the traffic consultant, Mazur. And Mazur is agreeable with all of them. The only one that might involves a slight site plan change is uh, DPW has suggested we look at the possibility of having uh, two exit lanes, you know, a left turn, right turn configuration. And Raleigh's uh, indicated that that is feasible, so we would that would become our proposal to D DPW for our permitting. Uh, and just to explain explain a little bit more about how these other agencies, agency approvals work. For example, when you go to DPW, you have the plans we submitted, in this case to you, which it took us a little, this, this has been quite the adventure. It took us a couple of months to get confirma confirmation from the town to DPW that those were actually the plans that had been submitted. But you take those plans which are site plans and DPW looks at them and uh, basically will tell you what you're proposing to do is acceptable and ultimately what you have to do is submit a plan, construction plans to DPW for the work in the county right away and they will approve the construction plans which are much more detailed versions of what you see on your site plan. So we are at that point. They've told us it's, it, it's, it's acceptable. Uh, they've indicated uh, to Mazur that the traffic study that we provided in December of 2016, which was reviewed by the board's consultant in the spring of 2017 and was sent to DPW in August of 2017, uh, is acceptable. And basically what that looked at the traffic levels that exist now the improvements that are proposed, and it found that those improvements are still um, adequate to provide the necessary mitigation for our traffic, which is not to say that the other projects that are in uh, coming down the pike, like Larkin LLC, if those go forward, those will have to do additional mitigation. But for our mi impacts, we are providing adequate, adequate mitigation with the travel lanes, the traffic, the traffic single and proposed improvements to the Larkin Drive intersection. And in addition, we're going to be providing some single coordination, which is one of the uh, DPW requests. Just as a matter of, I'm sorry to interrupt you, George, when it comes to the DOT, the highway superintendent, or the county DPW in terms of roadways, uh, what you usually do or what your practice has been in the past, when it comes to the final resolution condition, we require that conceptual approval has been obtained. We are at that stage here. We then say that the approval is conditioned upon that agency issuing the highway work permit, which is based upon the construction drawings that George has mentioned. And we have a third piece of that condition that says, in the event that that agency, the DOT, County DPW, or the highway superintendent, at the time of work permit review, makes further changes that affect the site plan layout, like the driveway gets moved, then the applicant has to come back to us for amended site plan or subdivision approval to approve that relocation. It's kind of who's going to go first here, and typically county agencies and state agencies get to go last, but we keep a little yo-yo string that in the event they make further changes, we can pull it back here. So uh, the third thing that was asked of us at the summer meeting was that we recent we had we had gone to the town board after a discussion with the with Mark about the potential for a town water district to be utilized to provide the water supply here. Um, we went to the town board in February of 2016 with a proposal that uh, the town 
we would construct the system, the town would take it over and operate it as a town district. Um, if you looked at the video, I, was, I amused myself because I said the town board was polite and we never heard anything further. So the planning board in December did ask that we renew that request. We sent the letter, which I think uh, you received, which basically, um, not to say history is repeating itself, but we haven't heard anything yet. So w uh, what we're willing to do is keep that offer on the table. Uh, if at some point in the future the town believes that would be in the town's interest, we're more than happy to um, make that happen. So the fourth thing was the we had an approval resolution, um, I think it was in October. The resolution was modified to put in the conditions from the preliminary approval. Some of those conditions have actually been met. And uh, some of them were already in the draft resolution. So we need to just work with your consultants and take care of the stuff that's taken care of. It doesn't need to be in a condition of approval if we've done it already. And to the extent there's redundant or repetitive language, eliminate that. What Over we'll do just again to interrupt, we're going to meet tomorrow and that will be part of what we will discuss then, but we will take that draft resolution that had 40 some odd conditions, whatever it was, put strike through for those that are no longer needed, put margin comments as to why put margin comments as to the status of other agency approvals and delete the repetitive conditions so that hopefully in the near future you will have a red line, which will look messy, and a clean copy of the resolution that should be ready for action by you. And that needs to be cleaned up and this has been a moving target as George is explaining. These things are happening, but we're getting to the point where we're nearing the finish line. So, Mike, um, in our package, we had a resolution of preliminary approval, Schedule A technical plan requirements for Dubja Realty, Bald Hill. That's, is, all, that's the list that, that you're referring to? <laughs> there was the preliminary resolution, and then there was the technical comment memo. That's now been put into the draft final resolution, okay. so it's all in one place, but there's an awful lot of stuff that's no longer needed. That, the way the preliminary resolution read is it dictated all the things that needed to be done before the applicant could get final, final approval. Right. Many of those things have been done. What we do then is we, we throw all those conditions back into the draft final and as they're satisfied, we, we knock them out until the thing shrinks up and it's ready for action. And that's the process we're going to go through now. So at not this, tonight, but now. At this point, the right. application is at preliminary plan approval. It's yeah. not final, subject to conditions. It's still preliminary. Right. Okay. The, the Relative, George, to water, just in support of the cooperative effort that has been occurring, notwithstanding the fact that we're not quite sure if the town board is going to want to pursue the district, we've worked with the applicant to add some provisions into the design that we thought would be helpful, that if the town cared to take the district, uh, the, the improvements rather, and create a district in the future, some improvements that would enhance the ability for the town to use the system. The location of the water storage tank on this project is very beneficial if a district along Larkin is established, just the elevation advantage. So they've provided for the ability to provide a, an additional storage tank on that plateau. Minor improvements like that, but we've worked with uh, Lenny's office so that if and when the town wants to pursue the option, if they do, we've planned ahead. So and they've been very helpful in that regard. At this point in time, all of the infrastructure, whether it's stormwater or water supply, so those are on their property and not mun they're not shown as like individual municipal lots because the, the, only, the, the town only board hasn't signed or indicated that right, they're the only interested. proposed town of Monroe improvement would be the road section. The road section, okay. That that limited road section. Wh why is that? That that piece is public and the rest is private. The town, the highway superintendent and the town board would not accept. They, they announced ahead of time right. they would not accept the rest of the road. Well, the well, yeah, rest of the road is basically serving the condominium, the townhouse development. It's residential. Uh, it really wasn't something that the town at the time felt would be appropriate as a public road, whereas this would be providing access to at least two commercial lots. Okay, so it's for the commercial lots. Yeah, that it's, it's more for the mixed use. Portion. Okay. Gotcha. Right. Okay. So, and if the town doesn't take the water, uh, the water facilities, it would not be the first time the town has not 
fully implemented a water project. There are, little known fact, there are water mains in Larkin Drive that extend to, oh, I think they extend to the town boundary. Uh, they were installed when then Industrial Road was constructed in 1989, I think, uh, with the idea that because it was zoned for development, it would become an area which would need and use town water. Um, the water mains are still there, but they've never been used. Mm -hmm. So, um, George, you had said there were three kind of outstanding items, architectural guidelines, DPW, that seems to have been progressed, and then yes. um, the town water district. Yes. Were there any others? The fourth is just the uh, need to consolidate the resolution so it's ready for final action. Okay. Um, tonight, did you want to go through the architectural? I think the, well, I certainly think the last board would have been delighted to go through architectural. Um, we would love to. Uh, we brought Mr. Hill just so, uh, till just so he can go through it with you, explain what he's done, where we've come from in terms of the EIS, and um, show you what we think this project will look like when it's actually constructed. Do you have a, do I have here th on the thumb drive don't anything or? I think we have no. PDFs. But we have. You have uh, handouts. I know we received one here. And, and as you're um, handing those out, m one of my questions was, does this building reflect w the one we have? I mean, maybe there'll be more. All the permutations, the variations in building design, whether they're walkouts, whether there's uphill versus downhill lots, um, et cetera. Are they all exactly the same, or are some of the buildings different in terms of the heights, the stories that you see, and again, because of the fact that they're working with um, slope? Right. Uh, the answer is, well, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, they are different to some respects, and that was the purpose of uh, Condition 34. Is to it's, we're trying to hit the Goldilocks zone, where we're not wildly dissimilar, to the point things look chaotic or unrelated, but at the same time we don't want to be entirely uniform. So in the world, in the words of uh, the former chairman Charlie Finnerty, doesn't look like a barracks, which is what he once described uh, Meadow Glen as. I think. Maybe I could read Condition 34 so you can see what the objective was of the architectural submittal. Architectural finish appearance. Hold it. There will need to be some acceptable guidelines specified for the exterior finish and design of the units throughout the project so that there is a unified theme and appearance for the project. It is recognized that if the different buildings are constructed by different builders, the entire project could look like a disaster and it will harm the desirability of the project. The applicant will propose some guidelines before final approval. Some of the elements that are noted as being important relate to exterior trim finishes and consistency of finish on all sides of the building, color and materials consistency. So that was the idea of what the applicant was to submit. Um, I just need a little more, I think we need a little more background as to the units themselves. Um, are these stacked multifamily units? Are these townhouses? Um, sort of what's the design? What are we looking at? Because you know, I see um, stairs going up stairs at ground level, or sorry, uh, entries going upstairs, entries at ground level. So sort of what's the makeup of these buildings and in the secret process or somewhere along the line with their floor, floor plans for these units? I, yeah, there were four. Um, first off, they're townhouses. They're townhouses? Right. So one unit is basically from the floor up. Okay. Uh, there was in the uh, original FEIS a uh, building rendering which was done in a conceptual floor plan for that unit. Um, basically, this is going to be two floors, basement garage. Yeah, so the, uh, again, John Till, architect. Um, the, the way these are constructed is they are semi attached single family homes. Um, they will have. Uh, 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 multiple levels as you can see uh, but each individual uh, uh, 
each individual uh, building lot is a single family home and they're attached in either uh, uh, <coughs> six units together or four units together or two units together based on the site plan. So each individual dwelling unit, even though they're attached, is located on an individual lot? Uh, uh, building footprint. No, they're not on an individual lot. No, not so on they're going to be in condominium um, ownership. Yeah. From the perspective of they're not individual yeah. lots. Yeah. Okay. So from the moment you walk into that particular dwelling mm -hmm. from the ground from the ground floor to the roof is owned by one person. So if I look at this unit here, there's a door here and there's a door here. Correct. So what you're looking at uh, on that particular rendering is the end unit, which the end unit, the, f the entry to the end unit will be on the side because that's more preferable. And then the center units, the entrance is in the front of the building. So this being so as you go across, center unit? Yeah, so as you go across the, the rendering, each gable in that rendering is a separate unit. Each gable. So there's one, two, three, four. Uh, yeah, and the, the the gable actually splits between it's a, it's uh, one unit plus uh, some additional space on the side inside that particular unit. So, for instance, the rendering that you're looking at here is a six-unit building. So the first entrance is on on the right. Then you have a second entrance after the first garage. Yep. Then you have two entrances in the center, which flank right and one flanks left. And then again, another entrance towards the left side of the building. And then a, a another entrance all the way around on the full left-hand side. So, so if we go by garages, the two end units have two car garages. And then in between, you have single car garages for the units in between? Correct. And so the two end units um, are all, the unit itself is below that gable, but you're saying that the four units in between are a combination of half of what's under a big gable and then half of what's underneath the um, dormer. Correct. Okay. So you have a, a single, in, uh, on the center units, you'll have a single garage and an entranceway to the unit would be considered one unit. Okay, so so for instance, so for instance, if you look at the two-dimensional printout here yeah, that was submitted, yeah, yeah. It, you'll see there's some dimensions that sh show you the the separations. There's a a dashed line that shows you the actual separation between the units. Okay. So that you can see the delineation. And it can vary depending upon the the architectural vernacular can vary depending upon the type of building that we're building, whether it's a four unit or a six unit building. Is it four, five, or six? There's no more than six per building, or are there more than six? Six is the maximum. Six max, okay. And in the interest of developing the architectural guidelines, um, we've developed a system that can vary depending upon the building makeup, but still be consistent throughout the project. Well, will have certain features, for instance, uh, roof dormers and gables and front porches that cover the entrances. And that would vary throughout the project, but be consistent throughout the project as well. So it might vary in shape and size and color, uh, but it would be consistent from building to building. Was uh, there any requirement that these be earth tone? Yeah. Earth tone? Yes. Okay. Yes, I believe one of the, in the statements, I believe there was, a, have a earth tone in nature. Uh, the, the colors be earth tone in nature. Um, we've also submitted tonight uh, the color selection guidelines, uh, which would be on this sheet here, and uh, where we've grouped together uh, the siding colors, uh, the uh, trim colors, the roof colors, and the stone facing colors 
uh, into groups of six different options. And those six different options, we have those samples here tonight okay. uh, to, re to review. And the siding colors? The si siding colors, okay. uh, trim colors, roofing colors, and, uh, and trim colors. Okay. And we've selected these in a way so that uh, they'll blend together, they'll work together in terms of the color palette, uh, but they vary to some extent so that doesn't uh, uh, it, ha it has some harmony throughout the entire project and some connection from one building to the next so that it makes some sense in, and in terms of so in terms of the style um, right now we have kind of one set of plans that show these dormers now the dormers are just um, are they decorative they're not there's not habitable space up there or is there just decorative okay so you have the dormers and then um, you have what looks like almost like a board and batten type look Correct. Um, and then you have the uh, horizontal vertical uh, siding correct are there variations on that or they're all going to have that vertical and the batten board well some have shutters no shutters yes so in the gables of the buildings uh, we show a board and batten type of finish mm -hmm. uh, it could also potentially be a shake kind of finish uh, a shake or a clapboard type of finish so these can vary throughout the project uh, as well as as well as the color vary throughout the project based on based on the approved list uh, they could we wouldn't be able to deviate from this approved list once it's approved unless we get your permission so um, I guess then the quest so so we obviously we have many buildings to work with right here, so we're trying to develop a, a an architectural language throughout the project right. that we can apply from building to building and what what gets applied will be done at the time of building permit application where we select the final composite of units the final selection of gables and dormers and the final selection of the exterior view of the building for that particular building block so the, the building blocks are going to remain the same as per the site plan the building blocks will be as per the site plan right so two four six whatever they are so what's going to vary are the architectural the architectural elements, elements. How, how many buildings total They are a combination. They are two units, four, five, and six. Let's see if I can bring it up. Yeah. I'm just I'm curious how many there are as far as then compared to the options. Since I'm not talking, if you put it up, I'll count them. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't do that, George. Good idea. Uh, here's the PowerPoint. Uh, is there, there might be a better slide. Yeah, they might. What is that? It's up to 17. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to get myself here to bring it to a good. Is that, can you read that, George? I can. Well, okay. I can So, um, so, I'm cu so I'm curious how many buildings versus how many styles uh, and differentiations. So uh, again, the, the variation will be in, in terms of the unit selected based on market conditions. Um, and Approximately 40. 40, thank you. And, th and that will, as, as those particular buildings come up for a building department review at that point we'll have an elevation of the front of the particular building in question that's going under permit and we've also at that point would have selected a color option from a b c d or e or f and that would also be tied to that particular building 
and the idea is that we wouldn't necessarily have the same building next to it with the same architectural look and the same colors. We'd want to vary it throughout the project. But, but the third one next to it may have that same color. So there is some continuity throughout the project. They're just not all right next to each other with the same color and creating a monotonous look to the, to, to the neighborhood, I'm trying to vary it a little bit within, within, within the guidelines. How visible, um, what I don't have a sense of, and I'd have to look at a grading plan, but how much existing vegetation is retained or is this basically a clear cut to accommodate all the buildings? So in other words, which relates to then how visible will the buildings themselves be long term? Or will they be screened over time by landscaping right. or? Um, well, the answer is, well, the answer to that last question is yes. Um, the, the EIS did consider that issue. There was, uh, there was an extensive <laughs> visual impact analysis that was performed as part of that because it is higher up. Um, and one of the things that's being done, there is a buffer area along the southern border to screen it from, um, I forget the name, of the, the name of the road, but it's before you, uh, so. Ne so joining the single family development there. Right. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Okay. And there was a landscaping plan that was developed, which uh, my recollection was it was acknowledged to be a robust plan. Okay. It's part of the plan set? Yes. yes. I think I saw landscaping plans. So it, there will be a substantial amount of disturbance to get the buildings in and the roads in. Um, there will be mitigation in the form of the landscaping plan to address that. Uh, the earth tone is one other consideration for that because uh, of the visibility. And the sense of this condition 34 is to make sure that it doesn't <coughs> look unappealing, even if it's from a distance. And, and the reason I ask is that when I hear earth tone, and so this is part of the question and discussion, earth tone to me, it sounds like they wanted it to be muted so it would kind of blend in to the environment. That's often why they call it earth tone. Right. And so when I see white, um, to me that's going to stand out. But whether that matters or not depends on how visible the project is. Um, so that's, I'm curious about all the colors that you're contemplating um, utilizing because um, if you're trying to have this kind of blend more into the background, I would envision slightly darker colors um, rather than lighter colors. So uh, absolutely. So uh, to respond to that, um, the items that we have that are white are typically either a window trim or a siding trim, which is a very, it's a, it's a minor uh, amount of uh, coverage. Uh, if, when you step back from the building and back even further from the site, what's going to be prominent are the, going to be the roof colors and the siding colors. Those are the, those are the items that are going to uh, cover uh, over 95% of the building, uh, whereas the trim colors tend to disappear as the further you go away from the building. So where we may be using uh, trim colors to highlight uh, gables and, and wrap windows and doorways, um, the the siding color or the clapboard color or the uh, 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 will be most prominent um, as you as you move away and those colors we do have and they are they are the the, the gray tones and and the sage uh, seagrass green and also so we have those to, for you to review as well okay so we'd be happy to uh, that'd be great show them to you sure so what I've done here is we've just tagged the colors that are going to this chart here. Okay. And maybe to illustrate John's point a little bit, if you look at the rendering from this distance, you don't really see the white. So these are one, two, three. And and these are both these are the vinyl siding colors, not just yes. the trim, right? Yes, vinyl okay. siding colors. And in some That's cases right. the trim colors as well. Okay. 
additional colors here as well, here, which match up to a series of our selections. Do you have examples of projects where they're large scale like this, multifamily or townhouse developments, and they've used different roofing colors per building? Um, because thing, something that would unite them all is the same roofing color. Um, I'm, and so I, I'm sure if they're close enough, it won't look that bad. Uh, I mean, it'll look fine, but um, I'd be concerned if you have sort of something that's in the blackish colors, maybe something in the greenish color. You know, it, there may be some disparity with roofing where those tend to be kind of the same, um, but then varying the, the actual siding colors. Correct, correct. So the, the certainly in, in, in keeping with the architectural guidelines, we'd want colors that that blend together, that go together, but we don't want it to be candy striped. Right. So to speak. Right. So right. we do, w and and uh, one possible option would be to uh, develop the roofing color per neighborhood. Yeah. So you have one whole block that's all the same roofing color, but the siding colors can vary, so it so it isn't monotonous. We'd be happy to address that. Okay. Um, just my kind of reaction as to some of the colors. I think they're light. Um, just my preference again if you're trying to get things that are more muted and closer to being and blending into vegetation or background um, foliage you know sometimes darker blues darker greens um, I've seen used uh, so that's just my reaction and I and frankly I think we all have to review this <laughs> just so you know we have a sense as a workshop um, so I don't know uh, thoughts, uh, you know, from the board members in general. I don't have much of an issue with the dark, with the darker color. I think it was the roofing one here. I'm just thinking when I come back from uh, roof ones. That's the one. I'm just thinking because I come down the hill from Route 6 a lot, like a lot, a lot, more often than I'd like to admit. <laughs> um, one of the things that really bothers me is when I look out and I can see the bright lights of Target. And I think the what is this, natural timber one, just if that would be something monot monotone, monotonous, I think would be better from a visual perspective from Route 6. Up close, I mean, I don't know how much attention people pay up close to the roofs. That's, I know I don't. I have solar panels on my roof, and that's all I can tell you about my roof. <laughs> yeah, uh, while we're on the roof, if they're are they the same patterns? Because they're two different ones, and I know the one was the architectural style of shingles, and I didn't know if the other one was as well. But I imagine you'd use the same pattern on yeah. all of them, right? Yes. Sort of, okay. Yes. As for the siding, I'm, I'm not sure what type of development. If it's like a luxury condo, townhome place, maybe you do want to go for something, you know, more of a beige color. Otherwise, I, I would use the apartments at t Timber Hills as they work. They look like they belong on the on a hill. So I don't, I'm not opposed to the white, but I mean, like I said, I think it depends on the type of development you're trying to sell. If, and, if and again, I think part of its intent, you know, because yeah, this went through right. the seeker process and there was an intent when those conditions were put into place. And so if they used earth tone, was it because they really wanted it to blend with the natural environment? Um, you know, normally we don't put neon on buildings. Um, so kind of what was the intent? And I, I'm going to guess it flows in part from the seeker process. Yeah, the most important part of the condition was to have some kind of cohesiveness so we okay. didn't have segments that were completely out of whack. But there was a visual analysis, and I don't recall myself exactly, but it may be in the resolution. If earth tones were called for, then it's your decision as to whether you satisfy that. Okay. Right. And, and then it's just a general comment because I, I want to 
you know, hit this point, and I think it's a question for Mike and Mark as well in terms of um, what was required to be submitted. Um, I'm accustomed to also toward the end and final approvals, especially with site plan, seeing floor plans, um, just to have a sense of the layout and the entries and part of the final approvals, um, and also to ensure, you know, ensure that it ensure that it matches whatever the seeker analysis was, um, if there were assumptions with bedrooms or um, et cetera. The, the assumptions are were limited by the URM zoning requirements, the density requirements. Okay. So we can't have more than uh, I think it's three bedrooms per unit. Okay, but are they all three bedrooms per unit then? Uh, I yes, think so. that's what you have seen. They may not wind up being three bedroom if for some reason it doesn't meet the tenant's needs or the owner's need, but they are, uh, yeah. When you say they may not end up all three bedroom, you mean they may be less? Well, yes. Okay. Somebody <laughs> may use it for something else. Okay, like a den or yes. et cetera. But do, do normally are floor plans, do you see no. the floor plans? Uh, the guidelines would be included as part of the approval and then it would become the building department's uh, procedure to verify that the individual permits that are issued comply with the the guidelines in the site plan. Okay. Can you make it a condition of a final approval that floor plans get submitted? And, and you don't have to answer necessarily right now. I know this is also stipulation, so what can and can't be requested, you know, I'm, I'm the, deferring the, somewhat to, the to Mark difficulty, and to Mike. The difficulty in asking that site plans be submitted as part of an approval is it makes it very difficult for Ben then to put him in a position where if the architect modifies to some degree the interior f layout but it's still the same number of bedrooms still the same intent of what you're improving does Ben say no I can't accept the change in the floor plans because it doesn't match what the planning board approved it puts it makes it very difficult for Ben yes. are these because we're, we're seeing a pretty um, finalized product here so this is this is what we can expect I mean this is what they're planning to build whoever the, the, the developer is yes the building envelope will look like that so the building envelope so this building envelope though is based on a certain assumption with regard to the interior space I mean have are there floor plans prepared so so what will happen here as as the market dictates uh, the floor plans will will evolve. Okay. It's an open floor plan, a kitchen on one side, a kitchen on the other, and that that responds to the market values and realtors and selling and how that moves through that process. So, what we've done here is we've developed elevation fronts that are interchangeable with those options as we go through the project, so that it has a continuity throughout the project. So that we understand that you know we understand that there's going to be a garage and you know on one side it's going to be a single garage or a double garage an entryway and bedrooms up on the top floor living spaces on the middle floor we know that that's how the building is going to to evolve but the actual selections will be done per building as they're being built so just so we don't have we don't have floor plans for particular units at this point. So in general, on the, the garage level, um, is it just garage space or will there be living space behind the garage? So and I guess it depends on whether it's a downhill or an Yeah, so yeah, it's, gonna vary, it's gonna vary all throughout the project based on up uh, garage on grades, garage unders, and how the, the topography sets up. Uh, within the, the unit, the, certainly, uh, for instance, on the, the two-car garage, that is over 50% of the, 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 the lower level will be garage space uh, and then uh, utility space and staircases behind it, possibly an entrance on one side for the center units. So there's some circulation and entry spaces going on, on at that level. And that'll vary if the garage is up on grade, that'll vary, and it'll just be a basement. Uh, so the, what you're looking at here would be the building that's built into the hill. You have uh, a, a high grade in the rear and a low grade in the front, and the, the, the basement would be behind the garage, essentially. And, but there are, are there variations where you come in to the garage at grade and then there's walkout space to the back? Yes. For, for a deck. It's grading permitting, if, so, if the grade so, permits. So it could be um, a situation where there you have three stories to the back. If the front is if the front is buried, the back could be 
exposed. So if the, if the front, front if the front of the building is a full basement, then the back can be exposed because we do have height requirements that we have to adhere to as well. Right. So if, if the front is buried, then the garage is coming in at the yeah. kind of the second level. The garage will be buried because there's entrance from the garage. Uh, on the high side. Yeah. Speak into the microphone, please. <coughs> so there's going to be entrance from the garage, so that that will never be buried. So the garages will there will never be any where the garages would be like at almost like at the second level. Never. No. Right. You have yeah, to. You're always going to come in at the first, and there's yeah. going to be the entrance would be from the garage. So yes, it's never going to be buried. Okay. So then the so the only the options. Back yeah. The back would be buried. Though. So the back could be buried, or mm -hmm. the back could be exposed. The back could be buried. But is are there any circumstances where the back of the garage, so that elevation where the garage is, where the back is exposed, so that you're seeing three stories? There could be such instances, yes. Okay. So that's the, is it, are those really the two mm -hmm. kind of variations? That's right, yes. So I think it would be useful to have one more set of elevations showing, if that's the one other variation, showing that and what that looks like. That's what I was asking about the grading. I wasn't sure how things were. So it sounds like it's either, you, you, so in, in any instance, you're going to come into the garage. Right. At, you're always going to come into the garage. So you're always going to see the garage and then two stories. And then what's different is on the other side, the rear side, you may have an exposed That's um, living area at the garage level or you won't. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. The stone around the garage, does that vary with the colors as well, or is it the same all the time? Yes, they do. there are um, uh, uh, different variations. It's a stone uh, veneer, yes. but the style and color will, be, will match the uh, other colors on the building. And building to building, it that can vary, vary from a bit. For, Yeah, depending upon the color palette that we pick yeah. for that particular building. Okay. Would it be helpful if I gave the board some and you could sort of take them through one and show them what's in the option? Sure. Will it always be stone or could it be brick? Um, w w we've proposed stone. Okay. Just for the continuity. Okay. And that earth tone feel to it. Okay. We felt that was the best. And perhaps if you have to do a digital de elevation and you're contemplating shingles, like a shingle look instead of like a, a slat board, um, maybe you could incorporate that to see what that would look like. Mm -hmm. Like a cedar shake, I should say. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you were saying. That might be one option Correct. for variation. Correct. So perhaps the elevation you do for this other alternative, you could also incorporate the cedar shake just to see a. Correct. Okay. And we could also vary the uh, the three dimensional rendering that we have here. We can provide you with the color options on these renderings. That'd be great. So you can see. So for approval purposes. Okay. So you can see this is what you're approving. These are the colors. This is what matches our chart. Yep. And we can provide that to you just so you have a guideline to work with. Okay. And, and then that, that, that makeup would become part of the architectural guidelines that we would follow throughout the project. Okay. And for Ben's ease of use, we should be able to attach to the resolution a set of renderings and maybe the part number, the cut sheet, but however you describe that roof, the, the, the shingle, by you know manufacturer's numbers so that we know what it is because we don't want to carry around your samples we want to be able to have Ben look at those samples and well, John's got that on the list, yeah. right. correct the we can expand selection. on the list that we've sp we've, yeah. we've right. given to you which does have the colors but we can also put some more product information on there right and you could even say or equivalent you know yeah. just or so equivalent. because if there's a just to be good to side, friendly right so and then you we know, attach a set of the renderings and that to the resolution so it all goes to Ben that way that would be for all six options we get one? Yes, well, so, so my thoughts are that we would provide the color options on one rendering, and so you'd, you'd have six of these, Okay. basically. And then we'll also do the other version of the, of the garage where, where it's a different grading right. option, and we, we would just do that as an architectural drawing, not a th third three-dimensional 
drawing, yeah. unless you'd like it as a three-dimensional drawing well, as well. Well, let's see the elevations, and then um, I I would like to see slightly darker colors. I'd mm -hmm. be curious to see what that looks like Very added good. among this. Sure. Um, I think just, again, to see visually what that could look like. I think that's very doable. If, if we have to, because the rendering process, as I understand it, takes a while, uh, are we able to get these to the board for the regular meeting, which is roughly? Fortunately, the, the changing the colors huh? is, isn't Anything? as complicated as Good. doing the, a new rendering with a different perspective. Okay. So we can vary the colors. Now that we have the rendering mm -hmm. understood and we have the architectural vernacular understood yeah. and the dormers and the windows, we could change the colors to show you the variations, just so you understand how we're, how we're shaping the project. Okay. So it's the same body in a different dress. Yeah, it'll be the same body, it'll be the same architectural, just the colors options will vary okay. Okay. from one and to the next. That to them for the, uh, you mean on the 20th, correct? Uh, yeah. Next. That's the regular meeting is on the 20th. Right, next Tuesday? A week from next Tuesday. A week from next Tuesday, Tuesday. because of the way oh, the month Oh, the way fell. that the month fell. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. John, on, on those six, you would actually identify them as the six options that you have listed on the... Right. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think, again, just, you know, I would like to get a sense of darker, slightly darker garage door, slightly darker, you know, just some darker colors to see what that would look like. Very good. Okay. We'll take that into consideration Thank as, you. We're, as we're composing this. Okay. Yeah. Um, windows, they're all going to be, um, are those casements, are those <coughs> up and down? It's a, a, a varying, it, it varies. Um, Essentially, the first floor windows would be casement windows, and the upper floor windows, which would be bedroom windows, would be uh, the double-hung style windows. So getting back to just generally the floor plans and the layout, um, the first then level above the garage is where the living room, dining room, kitchen, that type of space is? Correct. And then the third level will be where all the bedrooms are? Correct. Okay. Relative to the floor plans, I, my comment was meant more to what was tied to the stamped approved plans. Mm -hmm. If John's office has some conceptual floor plans as they perceive the development now, it may be beneficial for the board to see them, but I really hesitate to suggest that you link those to the approval. All right. But you could, you could have those reviewed just for general information as to where they believe the project is headed, but I... I really do understand John's comment that they have to match the market as the project develops. Because yeah, right. we, we I haven't even developed right. it at that point. Yeah. I've run into that. And kitchen sizes can change during that period. Yeah. Right. I've adapt. run into that a couple times where projects have been half finished and the developer has changed, and they've changed for the market, and the interiors have been changed, and the, the sales have taken off because they've addressed the current market. And, and we're trying to address here is the the architectural guidelines for the project so that that stays consistent. The internals of it can, can adjust. Exactly. Whether, like I said, whether it's an open plan or shifting staircases around and that sort of thing. Right. Um, but we want to make sure that, and ensure that the exterior of the building is consistent throughout the project as it, as it gets built over, the, over time. How, how big Understood. are each of these units in total? What do they range from? The, the, the building footprint of all three levels of gross square footage would be 40, 42? 40 40 4,200. 40 4, yeah. 4,200 to 4,900? No, 42 for the inline units. The outside is smaller. The end units are smaller, 4,000. And that's all gross square footage, including garage, two-car garage, one-car garage, entry space, staircases, yeah. firewalls, all of the components of the building. Okay, so that. each townhouse is about 4,000 to 4,200 square feet. Is that, that of, of gross that? area, of gross, gross, gross square, building gross GFA. Footprint. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I and I understand the need for the market to change, and you know, layouts will change, and kitchens may go in different locations, and et cetera. But I'd like to see kind of generalized floor plans. Not that you know. Again, if you come into Ben and you're meeting the basic parameters of three bedrooms, and um, you know. I think especially the bedrooms because the, the bedroom. Need too, the inline and the end. Yeah. Right. Right. 
That's all there is. Well, I think so. The only other variation would be those ones that can walk out from the garage. There could be livable floor area on the bottom. Yeah. But, um, you know, again, this is all tied to Seeker and other assumptions. So just generalized, what would these look like? But again, not that the floor plans are going to get attached to the site plans if that's not what was anticipated as per the stipulation and that's already been addressed already. I'd just like to understand the relationships of the spaces in the buildings. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I don't know, any other questions or thoughts on the design, colors? No. Um, any examples that you think would be useful for us to take a look at that this is kind of modeled after in terms of a, like an existing development? We can look into that for you. Okay. Oh, I didn't Absolutely. know if, it, if you knew. Yeah. Okay. So if you know of any that you think these are kind of the same character of the, the siding or the colors, et cetera, you know, just let us know so we could take a look. An example to draw Yeah, because sometimes seeing the real yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. You know, some sure, of the larger sure. projects I know is like Rampo Reserve down in Oakland. Um, I don't know of any, so I can't think of any in this area up in Orange County that have been done recently. With the earth tone colors, though, that's your yeah, with the earth something that has that kind feel of to it. Yeah, yeah. W with market well, conditions, not you. that much was done until very re recently. Which one? Market conditions, just. You know, the yeah. this, was, two, <laughs> Very this true. was planned to start construction in 2009. Right. Bad planning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That was the worst year for planning residential development. Um, anything else you want us to be aware of or that we should be looking at or um, that needs to get addressed? You mentioned the four points. Um, I'm, I had circled with this conservation easement. I'd like to get back to the town board. Um, with regard to the open space. Um, the water district is still s um, s out there, so I will also write a little memo or send an email just well, saying what's going on. We have condition, uh, in the current form of the resolution, there are th three references to conservation easement, uh, two references to conservation easement, depending on who takes it, and then the third condition relates to if no one is available to hold the conservation easement restrictive covenant. We propose to go with the restrictive covenant if the town board is interested in a conservation easement holding it, mm -hmm. we're willing to do that. This is essentially, what it is is an open space easement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really a, uh, it's not the full conservation easement where there's you know uh, protected areas and conservation value land that's being specific uh, things that are being protected. It's basically designed because we identified this remainder parcel because of the slopes as one that would remain open space. And so nothing's allowed within the, the open yeah, space area? As to what is and is not allowed because that's what's going to go in that restrictive yes. covenant. Well, I, well, tomorrow I'll show you the proposed restrictive covenant. Fine. I've got it already. Um, yeah, like you, I'd like to see the right the parameters. But it's not it's not you know to protect the uh, the, the corner blue butterfly or something along those lines. It's basically no disturbance. We are allowing some exceptions. I think if, if it's necessary, in conjunction with the uh, water supply. Yeah. Okay. You know, if we need to get access to something or put a trail through to do something, if the town were to take it over. We'd like to make provision for that, but it's basically otherwise going to stay what it is. And otherwise, are there other no disturbance areas, although they're not restrictive covenants? Um, is it anticipated that the buffer area, the yes. buffer area, and if I look at the water tank and the space that's between the water tank and the units that are immediately below that, is that all supposed to stay as it's undisturbed? Very steep. There's nothing that could be <coughs> that. It's okay. very steep area. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'd like to see the covenants, and, and again, I'll reach out to the town board about the water district and the so open space. We are hopeful that, based on the work that's been done to date, that we will be able to be considered for final approval this month. 
a very limited palette. We'll talk more about the conditions. I think you'll see they're, <coughs> they're fairly straightforward. They follow from the preliminary approval. They follow from the uh, site plan itself and the review that's been done. But it has been 18 years. Our client and I are both aging. <laughs> so I appreciate that. It's a little difficult for us only because I many of us are new to this. And to, to Mike and to Mark in terms of what their thoughts are, you know, whether a resolution for final approval has been drafted and then we'll need to go through it. So, I, and I appreciate that you want to wrap this up. You'll so one more draft before the meeting. There, there have been several iterations of the final resolution that were distributed to their former members of the board. But okay. It's more confusing to look at those. Let's wait till we get the new one that will be hopefully clearer and more narrow. Right. And if not this month, then maybe next month. But, you know, we're not talking a year from now. We're talking within the next couple months. Uh, but I do want to touch, touch base with the town board with anything that's on their plate. And, and we could certainly make provision in one of the conditions for something to be done if the town board wants it one way and if not the other way, such as the restrictive covenant versus the conservation easement. I would because that could be a condition of the final approval yes. that that documentation I mean, gets do finalized other, depending upon what the right and we won't really the way it reads now right yes. and we won't sign until one way or the other it's well, done it, it will be result it will be re i mean the, the only thing is we <laughs> we need to say they have to do something by a certain date to because yeah. in the past they haven't said yes or no they just don't answer they don't answer. right right no and i appreciate that so i think if we don't hear from them by a certain time period we just move forward but and, and, and just so you know in the letter we sent to the town board i asked if they would give us an indication or authorize its consultants to con conduct a review to do something uh by the february 1st because we we're hopeful of proceeding forward with you guys um, my understanding is they have not been in touch with the engineer or the attorney. When, when um, in general, um, when I've reviewed other plans, when does the HOA documentation be done? I mean, normally I've also seen, you know, the, 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 the planning board attorney take a look at it. It's done by the town attorney in our code. But, but it's done by the town attorney. Yeah. And has that been done? Has any been? It's a condition of the approval. Okay, so that'll be a condition of the final subdivision approval that the town attorney review any HOA documentation? Okay. There's different points at which it's yeah for some of the secret measures I, I look at it to make sure that they're incorporated but in terms of the general outline of it I think the code provision and the practice here for the town attorney to look at okay but that hasn't been submitted at this point no okay all right and so yeah I think we just need to look at go through the conditions and see what what's outstanding and then what can be incorporated into the the final Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You don't look that old, George. <laughs> applications, or did they get it in their no, package yet? yet? Okay, so um, we'll send an email to you just to let you know what I'm even referring to. Okay, but you want all mine to go to them now? Yeah, I think so. Okay, that's fine. Um, because I it will come. What we've been doing. That's fine, and they, it will come back to us, so we might as well get to them. And, and and the reason I was asking because I did receive that package I wasn't sure where they were in the process and it seems like that stipulation has certain time frames and I just don't want us to yeah. run afoul of the time frames and um, at some point we'll definitely want to speak to you um, with regard to the implications of some of those yeah. time frames and requirements like you know there's references to if you do a pause deck then it seems like the agreements you know out the window. I don't know if I'm reading that correctly or not. Um, I have to look at it again, Bonnie. I okay. Exactly how we it. It's okay. been so long. Okay. And well, so they're not on our plate at the moment, so we'll handle it when it comes in. All right. Thank you. Uh, Technical conferences on Friday mornings. Mm -hmm. Generally, the concept on those, just so everybody understands, is that we don't receive submittals in advance. Right. And it's not intended that there be any, you can't take any action because it's not a board meeting. The intent is more that applicants can come in and ask questions, review the code, and leave hopefully with more information than they came in with so that they can have a more complete plan when they do make a submittal. Right. So we really don't um, look at those conferences to 
to uh, move the project forward procedurally, right. Right. but more help get complete and accurate plans submitted. Right. And they have the resource of having Bonnie, myself, and Mike available so that, and even as well, Ben Maldonado, if a code issue comes up, right. so that they can uh, hopefully get the plans correct so that when they come in, things will move a little more right. efficiently. Right. I believe they're noticed um, in the event that for some reason everybody's interested in a particular project and you all want to show up for a tech meeting. But again, there's no obligation. It's up to you. I know everybody works. Um, I'm taking a little time from my job to do it. And um, you know, no decisions are made. But it is useful if someone's submitting a first application to say, hey, there's a wetland here, or hey, this is going to be an issue because there's a ridge line and it's going to be and a preservation area. So and even for ongoing, heads up. ongoing applications, it helps as well. In the case of Bald Hill, right. they're on tomorrow so we can go through the resolution okay. and, and make some progress on what items are complete, what items need to be modified or addressed. Um, I think we should have Noreen create a, and I can get something to you, a, a schedule sheet and either have half hour or 20 minute slots yeah for the larger projects you may end up coupling two slots for one project right but that way you could actually fill in a, a blank right I'm and then lost for this one. I, I, I will I what will I'm expecting. I will get you another blank <laughs> sheet <laughs> and usually what happens is the day before or two days before the technical conference you shoot that out to at minimum us so that if it's a repeat application we can bring that file with us right okay so it's uh now i had a woman come in and i didn't know what to tell this poor lady she has a property she wants to buy that they want to sell to you like this. i'm sorry <laughs> i forgot a woman stopped in the office yesterday and she wants to buy a piece of property and then subdivide it because it's like four acres or something too big for her and her husband they wanted to know what they had to do and i told them that we had this technical review board now that for her to figure out what everything is that she needs, that maybe she should come before you guys first. Is that what I'm supposed to be? I don't know what I'm supposed to be putting There's a gray line. We, we don't want to have the, the questions that could be fielded by Ben or by your office saying, here's the code, here's the information. Have everyone who comes in with a question come to a, the technical no. conference because then we'd have to have three days of conferences every right. month we well i so think that and also you know someone may just have an idea and they come in and and we have to be mindful that there's costs associated with the reviews and then they never submit so i think you know if there are questions you can always direct it to me mm -hmm. um and i'll try and respond um but okay. You know, maybe we could at some point develop a little bit of a pre-application fee where if they're serious and they they will pay a certain amount, <laughs> you know, to, to, yeah, to so just, yeah. yeah. No, right. Normally, if they have a consultant on board, they're spending money toward a goal. Yeah. So usually if it's a consultant involved, you know, it's a kind of a real project. Right. If it may never develop. Well, she came into the building department and um, our building department, is he's on the he's not in the office so the other gentleman wasn't 100 percent sure and he brought him down to me and i'm like well i have a board meeting this week let me get some answers for you because i don't know what to tell you and she says well i'll come back to you next week and she took my number but she wouldn't leave me her name <laughs> okay so but she had a survey of the property okay that they're serious of buying but she doesn't know if they can do you have the ability to scan it in she didn't leave me anything yet she didn't even leave anything with the building department oh okay do we have a scanner? I mean, if you wanted to no, scan? No, not that big. The biggest okay. I can make is that little map that I gave Mark okay. before. Okay. Yeah, and yeah I, we can't make anything bigger than that. Though. I know Ben's not available for tomorrow morning, but I, I, no, I think no. we'll yeah. work with him so that... Yeah, I think he should be the first. We can come up with a good relationship where he can take those general questions between yeah. yourself, Noreen, and Ben, right. get those answered, and yep. let the workshop be used for real projects yes right well i told him i needed to find out what it was all about because this was the first one and i had no idea okay so i said i'd get and they said all right she'd call me back so if she calls back then um we can direct her to ben uh right. or and, uh, and you can send me an email um you can always provide me with the lot block mm -hmm. section block and lot and kind of general parameter of what she wants to do and you know we'll try and respond as we can okay all right thank you yeah because we want to be you know uh, responsive to to right. people who just have questions in some way okay All right. i just wasn't sure i was like i don't know what this is about yet so i'll find out okay you 
you alluded to earlier that in relation to Bald Hill, there's things that we really can consider and things that we really can't. There's a legal settlement in place, so a lot of decisions have been made here. Can you just give us a sense of what's left to do between where we are and the finish line? What should we be taking into consideration and maybe, you know, what are some of the things that we sh already done deal issues that yeah. well, we should really be exploring? Here's an approval. It's called a preliminary approval. And what it says is, when the following conditions are satisfied, you're going to get final approval. So the resolution kind of, it's like a checklist. Once they're all checked off, there's really, you know, this isn't a do-over. It's they're entitled to approval. There may be a few conditions that will have to survive afterward, like some of the other agencies that won't grant their final approval until you do. But it's really, you need to approve it if they satisfy the conditions of the preliminary approval. Some of them involve discretion and policy, like the architectural, because that was not before the board at the time. Most of them are near ministerial. When they get their water taking permit, when they get their uh, DPW approval, so on and so forth, that you just cross those off and then they're ready to go. Revision to where we're at and giving us a real list of this is what's left to you know go over with them. This yeah. is what's left to find yeah. out about, and everything else is really done per se. And, and, and many really involve further review by the board, but will rather be part of a checklist that they need to complete before the plans can be stamped. <laughs> one he of took the eight years is, to come up with his questions, and then we're here at week one well, getting lectured really about a previous his, board and people I don't even know. I think he's more commenting about the other state agencies. I'm giving an idea. It used to be that a final subdivision approval was good for 180 days, could only be extended for another 180 days. After that, it, it lapsed and you'd have to go back and start all over. The legislature realized, both because of market conditions, but also because of the length of time it takes for other agencies to grant approvals that that just can't work. And they allow you to extend it in 90-day intervals over and over and over. There are certain agencies in this state that will take, it also depends upon how quickly you prepare new plans after they found defects, it will take years until they'll get you an approval. Yeah, oh, okay. Huh. Probably so it's not really on this guy either, actually. All right. I can't no, say that they have moved as swiftly as, as, as we might have liked, but uh -huh. they've been held up, and you heard changing regulations, and then uh, agencies that uh, want to you know, uh, see several iterations of the plan. It, it's a large-scale project. Yeah, so. Stormwater regulations have changed at least three times, yeah. in well, my recollection, yeah, since right. they were here yeah. when I was here. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the peril of having something that extends out so long that regulations will change and you may have to adhere to it. But, you know, realistically, 2009, the market tanked and there was no residential development going on. So that's part of it, too. So it's a ugly combination of all they of that. They had to try to negotiate water from three municipalities. When that failed, they then had to do the process of, of finding water drilling the wells, running the tests, getting agency approvals. It, it, some of that process is multi-year in nature. Right. Huh. Okay. So I think he was just venting in general. About the world, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't blaming you. Okay. <laughs> and we may hear it again. Yeah, okay. <laughs> George always comes back. Yes. So that's it. All right. All right. Motion Thank to you. adjourn meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right.